Hi, welcome back to IT Web TV at live at the Security Summit 2024. I'm joined by Marina Bidoli, who is a partner from Brunswick Group. Has lived in South Africa for a while and has moved to Italy, Milano. Um, but Marina's here for our summit, and I thought we'd just catch up with her um, and pick her brains on some of the the issues and around crisis communications, sure. which I think is probably an often overlooked part of um, cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, but obviously, once that breach happens, once that incident happens, we need to react. Um, and we can't just be an ostrich and put our head in the sand. Right. We need to kind of communicate to certain audiences, certain stakeholders. So I thought it'd be interesting to find out the best practices, some of the worst practices, yeah. um, and the best way of going about doing it. So Marina, welcome. Thank you. And uh, my a long history with IT Web, I was saying to you earlier, I used to be a journalist back in the day at the Financial Mail, and I used yeah. to deal with some of the IT Web colleagues from uh, from the 90s, 2000. And so, and yeah, it's very good, very good to see what you're doing here and the great, great conference. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so let's start. Um, Brunswick, I know, um, is kind of reputation management yeah. um, and communications company. So if you can give us an overview of the company's kind of expertise and perhaps a little bit of your own kind of sure. involvement in cases where there's been cyber incidents. Yeah. Um, so we started out as a financial communications advisory firm 37 years ago in London and have grown around the world. Today we have 27 offices around the world. Um, one in Johannesburg that looks after the Africa region mm -hmm. and works very closely alongside the other offices in the Middle East, uh, Europe, the US. I've moved to the Italian office uh, 18 months ago. Um, and from financial communications, we moved very strongly into other practices over the, over the more recent years, uh, cyber and data privacy being one of them. We have two deep specialist hubs in London and Washington, DC, plus uh, client-facing people like myself who worked on cyber crises around the world. Um, yeah, so we help clients with preparedness, preparing for a breach, which everyone's going to experience at some stage, unfortunately, uh -huh. and um, in the heat of a crisis, as well as helping them take a leadership position. Brunswick, over the last four years, has worked on at least 150 breaches. Wow, okay. Yeah, loads of them. Multinational breaches, big ones. Um, and we work cross-border teams. We stand up local teams who have the deep uh, relationships with local stakeholders, understand the local regulations, the local markets, the local media, the local stakeholders, and then we bring, bring in the deep cyber specialists who've come out of national intelligence in some cases. They may have come out of um, tech companies. They've got very deep expertise. Some of them are top top-notch journalists from uh, the top-tier mainstream journalists around the world who've dealt on cyber and data privacy matters. Sure, okay. I mean, you mentioned there are 150 cases. Yeah. Um, how many of those do you think were kind of clients beforehand? And how many are, oh, no, something's happened, or let's call it Brunswick? Yeah, I, I can't give you the number, but it's, it's a combination of both. I worked on a breach here in uh, Johannesburg that was a client in, in the U.S., listed company in the US and uh, when they were breached here we stood up a team in the US in London and in Johannesburg and we helped the client through that breach with reporting requirements here and internationally um, yeah so I think it's a combination sometimes it's retained clients very often our trusted partners people we work with regularly in the legal field forensics um, the tech companies or a fair Brunswick where they see a need for communication support, they'll say, look, we've worked with these people before we trust them, uh, bring them on board their strategic advisory, but they they roll up their sleeves and help you. Sure. With comms. Okay. Um, and I guess, I suppose it's kind of the same question, but how often do you find your clients are actually preparing um, for, as part of their kind of incident management planning, um, 
a crisis communications element or a communications element in that kind of whole process? So with our retained clients uh, and the, you know, the clients we currently have, we encourage them to prepare every year. Brunswick itself does uh, simulations every year. Okay. So, um, and communications is very much part of that preparedness. The, uh, when we get called in on breaches, I'm afraid very often they've done all the prep and the prep has been a technical preparation. They haven't role-played and built that muscle memory where you've had the multiple stakeholders with employee communications, HR people, legal, uh, the C-suite, the the, the technology, the CISOs and so on, all involved at the same time. And that is a problem because you see we, in our experience, the companies that have succeeded the best are those ones that are fully prepared, that have built that muscle memory ahead of time, that have ha- asked the hard questions. You know, do you have a ransom policy in place? What are the triggers? Uh, what data w- is actually matters? And some of the data is not that important. Some of the data is critical. Uh, what is that trigger? And um, what should you do if these people are on a sanctions list? So those kind of decisions need to be taken. That sort of slow, deep thinking needs to happen in peacetime, not in sure. all situations. Sure. Once you're in the midst of a crisis, it's uh, pretty chaotic unless you've prepared ahead of time. Yeah. And, and also I've noticed with clients, the ones that do it really well, they run those war rooms very effectively and they have a senior person running the war room. In the war room, you'd have the communications advisors external and internal, the legal advisors internal and external, and sometimes the forensic team's coming in and out. The reason being is that you get a rounded point of view and you're getting these experts from the outside that are doing this day in, day out, providing you with insights of uh, this is the threat actors, modus operandi, this is the best practice of what you should be doing, uh, don't go down the street because it's, it's going to have negative repercussions. So you build out those scenarios in, in real time. And obviously if you've done a, a proper scenario planning ahead of time, a proper playbook ahead of time, you've got your checklist. I mean, we did this. Um, in Johannesburg we supported a bank we'd spent a substantial amount of time working with a CISO uh, building a a cyber security incidents response plan with him we had all the templates 24 hour checklists uh, and the next 24 the next 24 and so on and they were breached right as we finished this playbook they were breached and we went through the whole thing tick box tick box tick box Um, I called on my experts internationally gave the chief executive and the board comfort to go out. It was a supply chain breach. Mm-hmm. So they had, they had comfort that their uh, transactional systems were not breached. Um, and the, the one lesson there was put the customer first. And that guided the response. But that was something we'd been preparing for. And when it happened, it worked very smoothly. We managed to close down that story within a week. Okay. which was very successful. They, there were subs- subsequent extortion attempts. And again, we shut it down immediately. But that was because they were so prepared. They had the confidence that they were doing the right thing. And the other lesson there, I would say, and this, is, this was a bank, they also went out first because it was a supply chain breach and they wanted to warn the other customers of, of the small little company that was doing uh, e- uh, email shots for um, marketing purposes. It wasn't an important enough company for them really to have spent too much time thinking about. They should have. They did do the due diligence, but it was more of a tick box exercise. They hadn't actually gone to check the company to see whether they had IT people. In fact, they let some of the IT people go and their systems were not up to date. But it was a small, small supplier and this is where the vulnerability is in the supply chain. And you're seeing that more and more. Supply yeah. chain vulnerability in, at Sardas. So, so it's really important that where you can actually bring in trusted stakeholders, work together, get that information out. I think that's something that we've been seeing over the past couple of days. We'll say a couple of days. It feels like a couple of days I've been here. Yeah. Um, but this past few interviews we've been doing is supply chain it's definitely been an area that people have talked around perhaps more so than in previous years. I think it's certainly kind of rising to the consciousness. Because more. that's where the, the vulnerabilities lie. Yes, yeah, uh, so you can protect your own thing and you can put your own yeah. efforts into that, but you haven't necessarily thought about them and their suppliers. So, yeah, I'm sure. Just done one in, the, um, in Europe. It was a multinational automotive company, foreign headquartered. And they had done all the preparations. One thing they hadn't invested in, despite all the prep they'd done, and it included communications prep, they hadn't invested in a document platform, exchange platform, okay. a communications expense. These are very expensive things to invest in. The breach inevitably happened on Christmas Day. The head of comms was skiing in the Alps. <laughs> nice. So they inevitably happened. Yeah. 
uh, sending confidential documents, legally privileged documents of WhatsApp, or even trying to find uh, your staff's contact details on WhatsApp and offline is not an easy thing to do. The tech teams are exhausted. They called in Brunswick to help, and luckily we were able to help. Um, but here's the lesson again is... Um, Oh, the other the other important lesson in that little case study was um, because it was multi jurisdictional. One data uh, one data officer decided to go public in their jurisdiction, and that created a knock on effect right. for the other okay. jurisdictions. So there were two lessons there: coordination, be coordinated at all times, and you can only do that if you're properly prepared. And then make sure you've got an alternative way of communicating because um, I don't suppose they really believed it would happen to them. Yeah. And then with big multinational clients, very often you'll find different ways of working in different countries. Plus, you've got that lag of uh, time zones. So these it just increases the challenges quite exponentially. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's perhaps one of the examples that I'm, I'm going to ask you now. But like, what's perhaps some of the worst things that you've seen happen in crisis communication where there's been a cyber incident? Well, the worst thing is where people are completely unprepared and where the management team is in a bit of a chaotic panic state, uh, not pulling the war room together okay. very clearly, going out very quickly with information and then having to backtrack, you lose control completely. I mean, there was um, a breach back in 2017, one of the first big major breaches of a credit bureau back in the day. I think it was a, uh, perhaps I shouldn't mention the name, it wasn't a client of ours, but we followed it very carefully. And they made a series of mistakes. So um, their website, they didn't put the correct information on the website. The tone of the CEO's communications was not right. And they underplayed the whole issue quite dramatically. Then they went up with Happy Friday tweets, even as the breach was there. They put, were still putting out cybersecurity reports as the breach, had, when, after they'd known the breach. And alongside of that, which was completely under, unrelated, some of the um, management team were trading on the shares. The breach had already happened. Wow. So all of that ended up in congressional hearings, class action suits. Um, they really were a litany of mistakes because they hadn't really planned for it. But that was one of the early ones. I think a lot of lessons have been learned in subsequent years. Mm -hmm. um, you're never really on top of it. I mean, I was listening to some of the keynotes this morning, and it's a very stressful job for the for the CISOs and CIOs. Yeah. Um, you know, this is not uh, a, a technical issue. This is an issue that everybody needs to take responsibility with. But things can go pear-shaped. I've seen um, actually a client of ours now in a UK-listed company, logistics firm. Um, the threat over log bit um, claimed they had taken sensitive data. They, in fact, hadn't taken sensitive data, but it was a ransomware attack. So the systems were blocked and the client wasn't able to um, ship goods internationally. So it was very public, it was, uh, a lot of commentary in the media. And they made the mistake of having a negotiator, which was an internal negotiator. Lockbit wanted 80 million sterling or 80 million dollars. I forget the amount of it. Ridiculous amount of money. They, they leaked the correspondence, all the negotiation tactics that they were discussing with the with the company, and because it was an internal negotiator, there wasn't that distance, and it became quite emotional. And the journalists were just lapping it up, and great headlines, great stories, and that's another lesson there. The the the, the thing that we were trying to do and help them very quickly make correct inaccuracies as quickly as possible, monitor in real time. If it's across jurisdictions, monitor in multiple languages. Very, very important. Direct everyone to your website because that is where your single source of information, you can try this. Single source of information and update it with FAQs. And put your customer first. And if you're a hospital group, you know, I just saw today in the FT, there's been three or four hospitals have been breached through the supply chain in London, which is the National Health Service again. Mm -hmm. Really, it's very sad, and operations are now being put on hold. Put the patients first. Whatever you do, make do the right thing for the patients. That's right. uh, and if you're another corporate, you know, do the right thing for your customers. Okay. Um, so I think media relations is obviously a kind of it's a part of what Brunswick does, and yeah. there are others. Yeah. stakeholders there. You mentioned the customers, the patients. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the boards, the employees. But I think. I sit on one side of the fence in the media and you sit on the other side of the fence yeah. um, as the kind of communications agency. Mm. What do you think the role of the media is in cyber? Um, should we be reporting incidents continually? Um, I mean, th that was my kind of initial thought was that once these incidents start happening and there's 
I think the information regulator said 150 yeah. reports every month. But once they start happening, should we be reporting them on a regular basis? Is that going to cause fatigue and kind of yeah. um, not annoy the readers, but just like, oh, well, it's another instant. No, oh, it's that one. Or do you think it needs to... What's, yeah, how do you see that mapping out? I think, look, I, I'm, I'm a former journalist, and I think the key thing there is to be uh, to use judgment. Because if a threat actor contacts a journalist and, and downloads a lot of information, be sensible about what is the mode of You're dealing with criminals at the end of the show. Sure. So what do these criminals want? Is this information, in fact, something that they may have taken from this breach? May have they have amalgamated something from previous breaches? Uh, they're obviously looking to put pressure on the company to pay. Sure. So I think, do you report on it? Look, if it's newsworthy, um, do you report on it? If it's something that you can actually warn um in the industry to, to protect themselves, do that. Mm -hmm. uh, always give the company a chance to reply. Um, I think the headlines, sensational headlines does lead to fatigue. Sure. I think, um, yeah, it's just another breach. And everyone knows they're going to, they're going to get tested at some stage. Yeah. Uh, so to try and do it is sort of educate people. And, to, and if the company's dealing with it badly, clearly report to them. But if they're dealing with it well, give them, give them a little bit of time to kind of respond to you. Um, journalists have got a very important role to play, mm -hmm. uh, particularly tech journalists like yourselves, because you've got this whole tech community around you. What we've also found very interesting is sometimes you get the ambulance, ambulance chases. Big breach happens. Everybody's phoning the CISO and CIO. They're trying to sell their product in there. And if these guys are dealing, it's a very, very tense environment. And so they're just batting them away. I'm sure. So, so yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a feeding frenzy. Sure. A bit of a feeding frenzy, actually, with all the stakeholders demanding information. And that's the hardest thing. You've got reporting requirements. You need to go out and report. But you don't have all the information at hand. So you will see these very terse little statements going up because the company doesn't want to go out and say too much because they don't know. Yeah. They might have got it completely wrong. Then they go need to, they get to have to backtrack. You're going to say, oh, we've been hit by a nation state, a state only to find later that some script kiddie has uh, found a vulnerability. Oh, and very often it is someone in the organization that was... Um, involved. Yeah, no, involved or just made a mistake. Yeah. That phishing, you know, clicked it. Yeah. Now with AI, it's particularly scary. I don't know if you saw the FT story um, two weeks ago. Deep fake in, uh, in Asia for a very big UK engineering, engineering firm. firm. $25 million. It was higher, actually. Okay. And uh, the money, I think it might have been a little bit higher than that, but maybe you're right. Um, the money was, uh, this employee was actually paying the money because he thought he was speaking to the CEO. He was told to pay the money to various bank accounts, and he did. Yeah. Um, and that is pretty terrifying, actually. Mm. I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of that. Yeah, I think so.